as GM chief coasts workers forced to accept cuts and strike prohibition. Yes, strike prohibition. Now, when when they gave the $350 billion, $300 billion of the TARP money to the banks, they didn't say, uh, by the way, uh, you guys, uh, you have to cut... Uh, uh, wages, uh, you know, we realize the average investment banker is making three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars a year. That's uh, just too much. Uh, you got to cut those. Uh, no. But here's where it gets truly bizarre. A little known, this is from RawStory.com, a little known provision buried in the Bush administration's thirteen point four billion dollar loan package to General Motors will prohibit. The United Auto Workers, from launching a strike as long as the company receives funds from the federal government. You get that? GM says, sure, give us the money and pass a law that says it's illegal for the UAW to strike. Not only that, writes the article, writes the article over at Raw Story, but a strike but a strike would give the federal government the power to call in their loan, putting a loan in fault and forcing GM into bankruptcy. The government now has the power to force a bankruptcy, quote, this from the from the legislation, if any labor union or collective bargaining unit shall engage in a strike or other work stoppage, end quote. Just when you thought you'd figured out how sick and twisted the Republicans and the conservatives are, they surprise you again. Or maybe we shouldn't be surprised. Maybe we should have known all along. You know, they're all running around. We had, we had I forget which one of the conservatives on this show it was over the last week, but somebody on this show said, well, you know, when Jack Kennedy cut taxes, it stimulated the economy. <sighs> These guys love to say they love to evoke the name of Jack Kennedy. Republicans love to evoke the name of Jack Kennedy for tax cuts. It is a lie. Plain and simple. It's a lie. Here is Jack Kennedy. I, the day that this conversation came up, I said, I'll play the clip for you. And then I got off on 16 other things and, and got distracted as uh, you know I tend to do. And I forgot. So here I, I, I just have to share. The, it's only a minute. But this is from the, the Nixon-Kennedy debates. In 1960, this is from the second debate, and Kennedy is laying out what he was going to do. Now, by the way, he didn't do it. It was Lyndon Johnson in 64 who dropped the top marginal tax rate, the top income tax rate on people making more than $3.2 million a year from 91% down to 74%. That was Lyndon Johnson. It wasn't Jack Kennedy. But it was Jack Kennedy who was proposing it, and he was proposing it not as a tax cut, but as a tax increase, because he and his family were making that kind of money, and he knew that anybody who's making over $3.2 million a year is not paying 91% income tax. So he wanted to close the loopholes. Also, back in that day, corporate taxes were set at around 50%. Now we have a top corporate tax rate of 35%, but in fact, corporations only contribute 9% of the total, between 7 and 9%, depending on the year and how you calculate it, less than 10% of the total federal revenue from taxation. It used to be during, during the Eisenhower years, when Kennedy was having this debate, it was between 35 and 40% of the total tax revenue to the federal government was coming from corporate taxes. Now it's under 10%, but in any case, here's Kennedy talking about what he wants to do. First of all, he says, you know, yeah, balanced budget is a good thing, but you can blow the budget out if you have a war or if you have a recession. Yes, I have stated in both the debates, and state again, that I believe in a balanced budget and have supported that concept during my 14 years in the Congress. The only two times when an unbalanced budget is warranted would be during a serious recession, and we had that in 58 in an unbalanced budget of $12 billion, or a national emergency where there should be large expenditures for national defense, which we had in World War II and uh, during part of the Korean War. So then he goes on to say that his proposal to reduce the top marginal tax rate is going to be coupled with closing so many loopholes that people as rich as him will actually pay more. He says we're going to gain revenue. Listen very carefully. Third, I think it's possible to gain a 700 million to a billion dollars through tax changes, which I believe would close up loopholes on dividend withholding, on expense accounts. 
So there you go. We're going to gain money by closing the loopholes, even though we're going to drop the top tax rate. And then he wraps it up by saying, you know, the Republicans are lying about my position. I'm telling you, on this show this week, you heard a Republican lying about Jack Kennedy. They were lying about it then as well. So in my judgment, we would spend more money in this administration on aid to education. We'd spend more money on housing. We'd spend more money, and I hope more wisely, on defense than this administration has done. But I believe that the next administration should work for a balanced budget, and that would be my intention. Mr. Nixon misstates my figures constantly, which uh, is, of course, is right. But the fact of the matter is, here is where I stand, and I just want to have it on the public record. And now it's on the public record. As he was saying, he wanted to raise taxes to balance the budget. I, I, I have to believe that there are still Democrats who are listening to these Republican lies and believing them. Because why else would this happen? And then we had the call from the, the caller earlier who said, uh, you know, Bill Gates, he's worth 50 billion bucks. Isn't, and, and Bernie did a, did a great job of handling this, but I want to take it a step farther. Uh, he says, uh, you know, what's, how much is too much? Let me, let me suggest that that's the wrong question. The wrong question is, what kind of welfare, essentially, what kind of government subsidies are we going to provide to wealth and great wealth? Right now, if you invent something, if you can, if you can lay a patent on something, then it's as if that just came out of nowhere. Like, oh, Bill, great, Bill Gates invented MS-DOS, therefore... He should be worth billions. And and let me put the caveat on here. I'm not going off on Bill Gates. I you know Bill Bill Gates. Everything I know of, about him, he's a very good and honorable and decent guy. I'm talking about the system here, not about him. But the fact of the matter is that when Bill Gates and in, in, actually he bought MS DOS from somebody else, he was a good marketer, and he improved it. But there were, there were other people at the same time who were also offering disk operating systems, DOSs. There were a number of them. At the same time that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, there were two other people who were claiming that they had invented the telephone at the same time and had the proof of it. At the same time that Marconi was getting credit for the, for the radio, there were other people who were saying that they, got, they, they invented radios. At the same time that Westinghouse and, 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 and Tesla were arguing about AC and, and, and Edison was talking about the, the bottom line is that inventions don't come out of nowhere. Inventions are built on the shoulders of hundreds of thousands of previous inventions. There's virtually no such thing as an invention. There's only an improvement. And I would submit to you that we are wildly overcompensating with our patent laws. And this was something that Jefferson was absolutely outspoken about. He did not think that patent law, that a patent should last more than three years. In fact, he wanted it written into the Constitution. Read his letters. You can, you can probably find these online. I've actually quoted them in several of my articles. You'll find them quoted in, in my book, Screwed. In his letters to James Madison in, in uh, 1787, when he was in, in France, he was the envoy to Paris, and Madison was helping write the Constitution, and he said he was going to have the Virginia delegation, who were all loyal to Jefferson, sabotage the Constitution if Madison would not put a Bill of Rights in it. And one of the things that he wanted in that Bill of Rights was a limit on corporate monopolies, which is patents. Because he felt, you know, three years, let them make some money for three years, and then, then it goes back into the marketplace and they get to compete. And what we are seeing, you know, and Disney really led the charge on this, uh, but what we're seeing with patents and trademarks going out to, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, now they're at 70 years, as I recall, the lifetime of the inventor plus 70 years, and, and things like that, is that we are wildly overcompensating people who make realistic and significant contributions. And we're wildly undercompensating, as Bernie pointed out, the people who are the real heroes of America, our police officers, our fire, firefighters, our teachers, the people who are, who are literally keeping us safe and creating the next generations, uh, the, the human capital of the next generation. So the simple answer is, number one, our patent laws and trademark laws are, are crazy. They're totally out of whack. And number two, our income tax is totally out of whack. We need to roll back the Reagan tax cuts.